So this is the uh, site of the uh, Orchard Barn Longhouse and you can see the um, remains of the uh, frame that was on this site and we are reinstating this frame using what timbers we can from the old house um, and then uh, introducing new timbers which uh, match uh, and we are able to get evidence from these old timbers for uh, the size and scale of the uh, frame and the fact of the joints used. And just behind you we've got the framing yard which used to be a car park but um, looks a bit like a jigsaw to me. So this is this is where we're uh, carrying out all our training work and you can see that we've got uh, our, uh, what is actually part of the west elevation laid out uh, on trestles and that is what we're working on at the moment. So it is an ambitious project that this year is finally going to come together. These key primary timbers will be joined with the secondary timbers to to become this reinstated longhouse that we've been working on for so long so very exciting this year it is a challenging year but it is very exciting that we have got most of the timbers that we need here now um, we just need for covid to restrictions to be lifted and for all of you gals and guys to be able to come back and continue the amazing progress that you've made over over the th four years now so um, we're going to move into looking at some of the tools next so. so this is a, a two-man crosscut saw uh, can be used either two man or one man but we usually have two people on this uh, just for, for uh, sawing timber to length and also doing um, uh, shoulders, cutting shoulders for uh, tenons uh, can be quite useful. What's, so, what's the age of this saw? This saw would be probably late 1900s, late 1800s, um, maybe early 1900s. It's uh, got a great, great American uh, tooth pattern, um, which is uh, out, what this uh, tooth geometry. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. We, we said we weren't going to do too much detail on the, yeah. on the tools, but it's very difficult not to. So, um, passing uh, fairly quickly on to auger number one. This is a um, fairly large auger, which the largest one that we use really uh, is good for cutting out um, mortises. Um, it's an inch and a half, and it has a nice uh, worm gear on the end. So actually, it pulls into the joints quite into the timber quite nicely and um, produces a nice uh, big auger hole uh, so there's less timber to uh, chisel out afterwards. So people are always surprised by how well if the, uh, if the worm on the end of the auger is truly sharp and in good functioning order how well this works. Yes. Yeah. And uh, the this second is a, auger? This is a smaller auger which is the one we're using for our peg holes. It's a uh, three quarter inch diameter uh, and goes into the timber even more easily because you're removing less timber with it as you go. Uh, but it produces the peg holes for all our joints. Okay, and uh, this is a typical um, framing chisel. Uh, again, it's an inch and a half, which is a very useful measurement because all our majority of our mortises are an inch and a half wide. Um, and. Uh, Nice, good, solid uh, tool quality steel and holds its edge very nicely and you can give it a good whack with a mallet without uh, damaging the handle. Excellent. So that is actually one of our newer tools, um, but this one was donated to us recently. Tell me what this one does. Uh, this is a corner chisel. As you can see, it's got a right, hand, right angle corner on it and it's good for cleaning out the uh, corners of your uh, mortises. selection of mallets which are uh, all sorts of different shapes and sizes. There's a nice square headed one with beach with a uh, ink and rope handle. And finally uh, this is a shoulder plane which um, I've used for years for cleaning up mortises, for cleaning up tenons sorry, uh, when you're um, 
finished cutting them out with a roughing them out with a chisel you can just uh, run over them with a uh, plane like this and it enables you to get right to the side of the timber without uh, because the uh, blade cuts right the way across. Excellent, so this is just a selection of the traditional hand tools that we use here at Orchard Farm. Um, there are more and we're considering making little videos of each one being used but this is just an introduction so I'm trying to keep it short. So this is the west elevation and we've got the uh, first two bays, bays one and two, are the ones that we've completed so far. So of these, the primary timbers, you've got the sole plate along the bottom, which sits on the brick plinth. These are the horizontal elements. You've got the mid rail, which is the one that the first broad joists sit on. And then you've got the wall plate along the top here, which is what your rafters sit on. So the um, main part, the main primary timbers, the horizontal elements, the sole plate, mid rail, and wall plate. You then have the vertical elements, which are the posts, bay posts. So you've got the corner post here, and that happens to be one of the few remaining original posts in our frame. Then you've got the bay post here, and the bay post here. And obviously you can carry on into bay three and bay four. We've got uh, sole plate, mid rail, wall plate carrying on right the way through to the end of the building. And then uh, bay post here and the bay post here. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so what are we working on now, William? Uh, well, because we've finished bays one and two, we're starting to look at bay three and four. The one continuous element right the way along the building is this wall plate along the top. So we need to have it so that the, it is, it's all joined up together. Uh, at the moment our wall plate finishes here, where it's come through bay two and into bay three. We've now got a new piece that goes continues from our join there into bay four, but it finishes about here. And we need to find a piece to take it right the way along to the end of the building. So that's what we're going to be looking at next. Right, so this is an edge halved bridled scarf joint. So uh, it consists of a tenon on the end here. This is the bridle part, that bit there. And again, the mirror image of it down here. And then this is edge halved because this is the edge of the timber. The timber has a face at the top and the bottom and an edge. So the dimension there is half the full width so it's halved and you've got a flat mating surface here uh, which is and normally on these sorts of joints for this frame anyway we're using a 100 mil measurement here a 300 measurement here and another 100 mil for that uh, so the the joint consists obviously of two halves this is one half and the other half is going to be on our new piece of timber this is the uh, edge halved bridle scarf joint which we saw the other half of just now at the other end of the timber and this is how we connect these long length of timber together um, this actually occurs just after the end of bay two this is the dovetail joint where the tie beam at the end of bay two sits so this is into bay three and you can see how the uh, bridle part of the joint the tenon on the top here connects in and there's a similar one underneath here and it's held together with uh, will be oak pegs eventually but we're using framing pins to pull the joints together the holes in the tenons are offset from the holes in the mortise walls so that when you push the pegs in it pulls the joints together nice and tight stainless steel peg pins in just as a temporary means to holding the joint together while we're working on the rest of the timber. So how do you know where the next story post or the gel post 
is um, going to be located. That's all based on our original plans which we had drawn up and gives us all the dimensions we need. So we've got a measurement from the centre of our bay post in the middle of, at the end of bay 2 to the centre of the bay post in the middle of bay post at the end of bay 3 and we know that that is 3.6 metres. So we need to locate the middle of that post on our wall plate and then a 3.6 metre measurement to here will give us the middle point for our next bay post. Okay, so I'm just going to step back and record where that post is located there. So we've got the middle of the post here. Yep. And so you'd yeah. be measuring from the centre of that right the way along to the centre of where the next post comes. So we've got to uh, the end of bay three here with our bay post here. We need now to have the wall plate sufficiently long to come to the very end of the outside of the, of the house, which is going to be down there. So we need to extend it with a piece of timber from here using the same edge halved bridle scarf joint on here. Uh, we need a piece that's long enough to get to, us to the end of the building. So, so I, um, I understand this timber here is going to be joined to that just timber long there. enough to get to the end of the building that's handy <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, this is a small oak tree that we had milled last december so how old would this tree have been well if you wait a minute i can count the rings but uh, it would be uh, probably about 40 years old i should think Right, so this is the uh, end view of this uh, timber we're going to be using. As you can see, it's um, a box heart, which means that the heart of the tree is right in the middle of the timber. And we're using every scrap of timber from that tree that we can for this beam. The tree was only just big enough to get what we need. In fact, um, if you were use, doing a really high status building, you probably wouldn't use timber that's as uh, sappy as this. But for our frame, uh, that won't make any difference. We've got enough uh, solid timber here still to um, give us the load-bearing capability that's needed. And from what we've seen of the old timbers, they use what they had. There's still quite a lot of sap and waniness on them, so yes. very happy to be using a uh, small dimension tree. So this is the wall plate um, and William's about to make an assessment as to which edge so, um, um, to use. So. Yeah, the first thing I want to do is to go over it with a brush and just clean it up and while I'm doing that I'm looking at all the, the timber in more closely and working out what the uh, defects in the timber are and how I'm going to orientate it in our frame to the best advantage and I can see straight away that uh, we've got more complete edges to the timber at this end and it becomes more wany as it works down this way, uh, bearing in mind that this end is going to be the end of the building and we may even lose the very end of this because it will be sticking out beyond the end, we'll aim to put our scarf joint at this end where the timber is most complete um, and it will be easiest hopefully to get our nice tight joint marked out and cut at this end. So uh, having decided that, I yeah, then need to decide which way up to have it. And I'm also thinking about where the other timbers are going to interact with this as we build the frame. Uh, so we're going to have a series of studs coming up to it so we want a reasonably nice, uh, sharp edge to uh, bring, bring our joints up to, our studs up to. Um, so I'm thinking possibly we might have this as the underneath and this as the top. But we also need a nice, sharp corner here for our rafters to sit into. So that as they come down the roof, they, they're meeting this 
in a nice, a nice tempo and we haven't got too much complicated scribing to do to get our rafters to sit nicely. So from what I can see at the moment I think we'll make this the top and uh, this the bottom and so this will be the outside face of the building. This also has the least amount of uh, sap on it so that any weather that gets towards this timber from the outside uh, the timber will withstand that best. Okay, so having decided how we're going to orientate this timber, I'm going to mark it so I can always remember that and refer back to it, even though I'm going to be turning it round and turning it over. So we decided we're going to make this the top outside corner. So I'll do a nice clear mark with a wax crown there. So I know that however many times I turn this timber over, and I will be, I can always refer back to that and it's, sure that I know that that's going to end up on the top and the outside of the building. Excellent. And is that a mark that you, is exclusive to you or are you... No, not particularly. It's one that um, generally um, timber framers, uh, carpenters in general probably use that as a symbol to mark an important reference face. And in this case it's the top outside yes. part, edge of the, the, tree. Of the wall plate. So we've got uh, now to, to mark the timber with lines on it So because uh, we're working with relatively irregularly shaped timbers and we need to put some accurate marks on for our joints and the way we do that is to uh, put lines on the timber which uh, are regular and straight and create a perfectly regular plane through the timber even though the timber itself is wobbling about. Um, and we've got the choice of, um, in this instance, two different methods. We could use a chalk line, which is this tool here, which is a fair traditional uh, means of marking timber. And you still see on some of the old uh, medieval frames where they've used chalk lines. They stay on for quite a long time. Or this is a more recent uh, Japanese ink line, which is, again is based on an old Japanese um, tool. Uh, which has been updated and uh, modified and is quite produces a really nice pine line but unfortunately it doesn't work terribly well when the timber is wet um, and uh, our timbers are out in the uh, frosty environment at the moment so I think we'll stick with the chalk line and uh, hope we can still see the lines when we come back to them later. So uh, we're going to start putting some lines on the timber now and the line we're using in the centre of the uh, timber is, is going to be a, a centre line. Uh, this timber is nominally uh, milled at 200 mil, uh, or if you like old measurements it's, four in, it's 8 inches. So the middle is on the uh, 4 inch mark or the 100 mil mark. And so I mark that at one end and then I go down the other end and mark the same point, measuring always from this Paris here, which is our outside face, which is the one that we know is uh, our reference face. Okay. Can you just explain Aris? Yeah, the Aris is the uh, corner of the timber. short line in place and the next important step is chalk line center so having put a center line on the top face of this timber we're now going to mark the outside face and for this we're using a 50 mil or two inch line uh, Probably because that's traditionally how uh, uh, the, the frame was um, constructed when, when they started the project. And it makes the um, maths quite easy. If you put a 50mm line on the top and 50mm line on the uh, sole plate, then you just have to subtract 100mm uh, off the measurements you have from the top of the uh, wall plate to the underside of the sole plate. Uh, this is the middle of the tree more or less and you can see how that straight line 
we've now pinged on is showing that there's a deflection in the in this timber by about uh, six mil because it should be 50 mil that uh, line is from the top of the timber but it's actually only 44. Uh, that's the reason for putting lines on timber because we can then, having put the line on, we can use that to give us our measurements for our cutting our joints rather than the actual face of the timber. So having put our lines on two of these uh, faces of the timber, the top and the outside edge, we now need to transfer them to the other two sides of the timber which aren't marked yet. Um, we could do this with a square at the end if the timber was accurately milled, but because it varies a bit, uh, it's, the only accurate way of doing this is to level the timber first and then use a spirit level to mark the ends of the timber from the lines we've already put on. So that's what I'm going to do now and um, it's always useful to have a fairly uh, obvious levelling point and levelling mark so that in the future when we're laying this up in the frame we'll always put the spirit level on at the same place and get, that, get it level at that point and then we know that um, we can uh, mark our, when we cut our joints, they should all be level relative to each piece of timber. So laying spirit level on here, you can see that it's not quite level, so I've got to um, wedge the timber to get it level. The first thing though, I'm just going to uh, run my plane across here to create a reasonably flat level doesn't rock. Now because I want to be able to always refer to this point, I'm going to mark this with a leveling mark. And this is a mark that most timber frames will be familiar with and we'll, whenever they see it on the timber then that's where they have to put their spirit level. Now it's telling me I need to put some wedges in to get this level. You never have too many wedges and packers for doing this job. Let's put the wedge in here. Another one in on the other trestle. It looks just about level there now. I just moved it slightly. Do you need me to move? No, that's alright. So now I'm happy with that. So I can take the spirit level and use it at the end of the timber. So this is your levelling mark. That's levelling yeah. mark. Our uh, timber nice and level and this is the line we created on the outside of the timber so we just use the spirit level to give us a nice level line across there which looks to me about there. We draw that on the end there and we know that if we our chalk line from that point there we'll have a exact mirror image of the line we've already done on the other side. So do the same with the vertical one, the one in the middle here, which is where I pinged my line before. And we can use the spirit level to create another straight line down the end. This is about there. And that's giving us a nice horizontal and vertical line in the ends of our timber. Okay, so we've now taken this timber which came in from the woods, freshly milled, and we've uh, lined it, uh, levelled it and lined it, and got it ready so that we're now uh, ready to mark it up and use it as part of our frame. Brilliant. So this is the end of the first video, watch this space, we'll bring you that marking out soon.